Hi, everybody. Welcome to Evaluating Zebra Mussel Suitability in Northwest of Wisconsin Lakes. Wanted to um, welcome you to our session. It's 1.15, so we're going to get started right away. Um, I'm Diane Dalton, and I'll be the moderator for this session. And um, before we get started, I just wanted, I was thinking about like, what kind of inspirational quote could I come up with? And weirdly, I Googled some things, and here was, perhaps the truth depends upon a walk around the lake. And I thought for this session, maybe that's true on some lakes, but in some lakes, maybe um, a walk around the lake wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate until it's already too late. So I thought, well, that, that's an interesting way to start the session. Um, I wanted to also remind you some housekeeping details for people who might not be as familiar with Zoom. Uh, we wanna remind everyone that this presentation is being recorded and that you can type your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to be monitoring the chat box and present the questions as they come in so we can be able to answer as many as we can during as time permits. Um, and with uh, that, it's my pleasure to introduce this session's co-presenters, Lisa Burns and Tom Bovet. Uh, Lisa and Tom are the AIS Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinators in Washburn and Burnett counties respectively. They help to coordinate a variety of AIS prevention control and education programs. Both speakers enjoy the outdoors and in their free time can be found out hunting, fishing, hiking, and doing just about anything else involving fresh air. Good for them. With that, I would turn it over to Lisa and Tom. All right, thanks, Diane. Uh, Lisa Burns here with Washburn County. So um, I'm gonna kind of start it out here a little bit this afternoon. And thanks everybody for joining our session. Tom and I were kind of excited to be able to present this information and uh, do this study. So uh, glad to have you on board. Uh, so we'll just jump right into it. This first slide that, that we're all looking at, this is just kind of a quick snapshot of what we're gonna be going into later. Um, this is uh, from the AIS or Aquatic Invasive Species smart prevention tool map and it's just kind of shows uh, different suitability so if you look in the upper right part of that uh, map there's suitable borderline suitable and unsuitable and then no data so these are some of the lakes that are um, have the suitability for the zebra mussels uh, in the northwest part of the state and again that's just a snapshot but tom's going to go into that here in a little bit Next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of a background on how all of this came about. Um, zebra mussels were found in Big Mackenzie in 2016 by a landowner who was actually bringing his boat out for the fall or in the fall. Uh, he found it on his dock. Um, and so he contacted DNR and we kind of moved forward from there. And that was the first inland lake of the 12 uh, inland lakes in the Northwest that discovered the zebra mussels. So it was uh, quite shocking to get the phone call that uh, they had been found. And then about a year later, they were also found in Middle Mackenzie. So there's also a Lower Mackenzie. So it's a chain of lakes and Lower to date does not have zebra mussels um, uh, confirmed yet. So with that, we started a zebra mussel management team, which consists of a lot of different partners. Uh, some of them I know are probably on this, um, watching this today. So thank you if, if that is one of you. So it's a lot of state and federal agencies, uh, Burnett and Washburn County um, Lakes and Rivers Association members, and of course, we couldn't do it without all of our volunteers on our lakes helping with monitoring efforts and doing the education out there. So thanks to everybody who's been involved with that so far. And so as time progressed, uh, we were getting a lot of questions about uh, the AIS Smart Prevention Tool. And when you look at that tool and you see a certain color on your lake, you wonder, well, what is the actual calcium in my lake, like how can I figure that out? So we figured 
we had some money left from a rapid response grant that we had gotten through the DNR. And we decided let's do this study. So uh, we went through the process, got the, the scope amended, and we were able to do the study in the fall of 2020. Next slide. So what is the AIS Smart Prevention Tool? So it's a model that basically provides predicted suitability for six high profile invasive species. So suitability means kind of what are the factors that make, um, make it suitable or um, available to a, a species to make it survive in a water body. So this was developed, the model was developed by the UW Center for Limnology and DNR. And these predictions were really based off of peer reviewed studies um, for each of the different species. So that link right there in the slide is the link to the smart prevention tool. And I'm gonna have Paul click on that. And I don't know, Tom, are you gonna kind of go through it then? Yeah, we'll just kind of walk through it here. Uh, Paul can control it, but we'll kind of walk around. I see that he already has the Burnett and Washburn County area pulled up, so that's great. Um, and he has the species uh, kind of selection in the left-hand corner already highlighted there. So any species that you're interested in, you can click on that. For us, it's obviously zebra mussels. And you can scroll around and you can see uh, your lake of interest and see what it's labeled as, as suitable, borderline suitable, or it might not even have any data or unsuitable as well. Um, so he zoomed in on Big Mackenzie Lake. That's what we were talking about. That's where the zebra mussels first came in. And if you zoom out a little bit, Middle Mackenzie, which is the next one north there, um, is listed as borderline suitable. And they are also in that. So that kind of got a, a lot of the questions moving. Well, they're in both lakes. One of them is definitely listed as suitable and one of them is listed as borderline. So what is the actual cutoff? You know how much calcium do they need and how, how accurate are these models? And there's obviously tons of lakes here in the Northwest. So we kind of wanted to explore this to see what the risk was on a lot of these other lakes. And uh, also mentioned that in the top bar there, it says about this tool and it also has species and model information. So if you click on the species and model information on there and you go to zebra mussel, it talks about the peer reviewed study uh, that uh, this was all based on. And it talks about where the data came from. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but everything that we uh, used in evaluating the smart prevention tool was based off what is actually in the smart prevention tool. So we took their equations and we used it to do kind of our own current analysis on, on the Northwest Lakes here. So in your spare time, if you have uh, your, an interest in this, I would definitely check it out, not only for zebra mussels, but anything else too. It's a, a pretty cool tool. And with that, uh, we can go back to the presentation. And Paul, you're gonna um, attach that in the chat too, correct? Yeah, I can put the link in the chat. Thank you. So next slide then. And this slide kind of is a summary here. Uh, of what we just went over. Um, and another thing I want to mention on here is that this was this tool is a collaboration between the Center for Limnology and the DNR, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So uh, staff from both helped create this and a lot of people had a lot of cool studies that went, went into the development of this. Next slide. So how did uh, we choose our lakes? Uh, Obviously there's tons of lakes in Burnett County and Washburn County, but we only had funding to do 30 lakes. So we were kind of um, stuck a little bit. It was a hard decision to make, but we uh, ended up doing 30 of them and we picked them with a variety of different suitabilities. We wanted to pick some that had suitable, borderline suitable, unsuitable to see if their categories would change or stay the same and how accurate the tool was. And we also picked them on uh, proximity to the Mackenzie Lakes. Uh, Lake Association involvement is a big one if the Lake Association is really involved and they're really asking that question, well, what is the actual calcium measurement in our lake? Um, that was also a factor. And then uh, 
voter traffic it was also um, a part of it as well, which ones get used the most. And uh, that was kind of how we chose them. But it was 15 lakes in Washburn County and 15 lakes in Burnett. Next slide. So this is uh, the big slide, so to speak. And what defines zebra mussel suitability? So zebra mussels rely on calcium to build their shells. And that's the primary factor that is used to determine suitability. And that's it's how, how much calcium is in the lake. And before I get too in depth with this, uh, you'll notice in, in some lakes, there's tons of snails and native mussels. And then in other lakes, they're almost non-existent. And that is also based off of calcium in the water. So you can kind of think of it that way as your muscles react in the same way. And uh, the equation the smart prevention tool uses to determine calcium levels is based off conductivity. And what conductivity is, is essentially the electrical charge of the water, um, how much electrical charge goes through that water, and then you get a measurement from that. And that's based off of the ions that are kind of floating around in there. And calcium ions are a part of that charge. So there's a direct relationship between how many calcium ions are in there and what you should expect the conductivity measurement to be. And then you can kind of relate those two. So this equation here does just that. It takes the conductivity measurement and predicts approximately how many milligrams per liter of calcium should be present in that water. It's not obviously perfect because it is a model, but that is the model that the uh, is, is published for the smart prevention tool. And that's what we also used in ours. And these are the categories here for uh, suitability. So not suitable is less than uh, 10 milligrams per liter of calcium. Borderline is between 10 and 21 and suitable is greater than 21. Um, and before I get too much more further in that, uh, the borderline suitable category, even on the lower end there, uh, you may still find zebra mussels because even if the calcium is a little bit lacking, they might just have a thinner shell. So they might be present, their shell just might not be as robust as say a, a lake that has tons of calcium in it. And uh, calcium is largely affected by the parent material, so to speak, of the lake. Um, you know, if it has uh, limestone in it, it's going to have more calcium, uh, kind of that what the lake was built on, so to speak, when it uh, inundated long ago. Next slide. And the data that's used in the smart prevention tool was a little bit of a, not a concern, but a, a bit of a question for us. And that's why we wanted to see how accurate it was. So the conductivity measurements that are used in the smart prevention tool, at least for our area, were based on the surface water inventories carried out in Wisconsin between 1960 and 1988, or 1980, I'm sorry. And uh, in Burnett County, ours was on the lower end towards 1960s. And then in Washburn County, it was a little bit later towards the 1980. So a little bit of a gap there, but nonetheless, this data is pretty darn old and lakes are not necessarily static systems. So you might expect those numbers to change slightly. And obviously technology and science has certainly advanced since then. And we just kind of wanted to see if this old data was still pertinent to today. Next slide. So how are the water samples collected for the lab? Um, we use a six foot integrated pole sampler, essentially a fancy PVC tube with a ball stop on the end that collects some water. And uh, this was advised to be used by uh, the DNR biologist, I believe it was Katie Hine. And uh, we conducted this at the deep hole. And the reason the six foot integrated pole sampler is uh, good for this is because it collects a um, column sample instead of a surface water sample or, or a van dorm where you're only getting one section of the water. This is getting multiple different depths in one sample and uh, kind of combined to get a, a relatively accurate measurement. And uh, the procedures for using that were outlined in the long-term trend sampling manual by the DNR. So we, we followed all the DNR protocols and, and the advice that was given to us by DNR staff. The lab we used was the uh, State Lab of Hygiene and with uh, any metal samples like calcium, uh, 
it needs to be fixed with nitric acid. And essentially what that does is it's a preservative for a lack of a better word. Uh, it keeps the calcium level the same as when you collected it until the time it reaches the lab. And the nice thing about that is it has a pretty long shelf life. So if you can't get it to the lab right away or you're doing multiple lakes and you need to kind of wait till you've completed all the sampling, you can wait a couple of weeks before you send them out. And they don't need to be cold either, which is another bonus as compared to some other samples. And since Lisa and I did uh, 30 water bodies, we decontaminated before sampling on every water body and uh, made sure all the, everything was, was clean and, and ready to go. And since we did sample the Mackenzie Lakes, we did those last. Since those have zebra mussels in them, we want to do those last before we move on to anything else. Next sample, uh, slide, please. So how were the water samples uh, collected? Uh, you know, where do we go in the lake? Uh, I mentioned the deep hole. If you have trouble finding out where that is, you can go on the surface water data viewer and click on um, the layers tab and it's going to say monitoring stations and uh, data or something, something along those lines. And it will pop up all of the stations in the state. And when you click on those, it'll tell you what they are. It could be a boat landing station, um, a lake station, or in this uh, snapshot here, the deep, deepest point. So here on Mud Hen Lake, uh, that little triangle there is where we would be sampling because that would be listed as the deepest uh, point. And with any water sampling, it's usually done at the deep hole. So this is consistent with any other data. And the data that we collected should be underneath these station IDs as well. Next slide. So for the lab analysis, like I had mentioned, we went through the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. And this is the best option when you're working with a DNR surface water grant. Um, they work really well with these grants and they help get the data into the, the SWIMS database, the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System. And uh, it's, it's really, simple to work with them. And the, the payments uh, for grants is, is a lot easier when you work with the state lab as compared to going to a, a different private lab as well. So I would highly recommend staying with the state lab of hygiene if this is something you're interested in. The calcium was reported back in milligrams per liter, which is nice and easy. You don't have to do any conversions. It's exactly what the uh, smart prevention tool uses. Um, you will need to create lab slips, lab slips in SWIMS for each station you're sampling at, and I'll get into that a little bit more. And the samples are relatively inexpensive uh, compared to a lot of other water sample samples that you could uh, pay for. So $36 per lake is, is pretty inexpensive and gives you a good snapshot of what you're dealing with. Next slide. So making lab slips and swims, it may sound daunting, but it's really not that bad. Um, if you're unfamiliar with doing this, um, contact your regional citizens like monitoring network coordinator. I'm sure they could help you or even a local AIS coordinator. Essentially what you do is you go to the forms tab in swims and there's a nice little thing that pops up that says generate a lab slip and you select what you're doing. So if you're doing inorganic or organic sampling, um, whatever you're doing, it, it has, it's a simple drop down menu, you select it. And when you're done filling in all of the, the blanks, essentially, it gives you a nice printout sheet that you can see here on the right that you need to take out into the field with you and fill that out because that is what gets sent to the lab. And the lab needs to have a lab slip uh, to complete the uh, testing and get those samples reported back to you. And on that lab slip there, you can also see that there's a little nitric acid slip on there and the state lab of hygiene needs to have those uh, stuck right on there so they know uh, for their own records which batch of nitric acid you used in case uh, they had a bad batch or they can also use it for tracking funds in their own uh, business. So that you need to have that on there as well. Next slide. So now we can get into what we found. Um, the AIS smart prevention tool is not perfect, but it can be a good baseline. And I would still recommend using it. 
uh, to give you a, a, at least a starting point. Uh, some lakes did flip suitability categories and interestingly enough, some of them went one way into the more suitable side of things and the others went uh, the, other, the other way. So here I've highlighted two examples of one is Birch Island Lake and one is Mud Hen Lake here, both in Burnett County. So Birch Island Lake, uh, the smart prevention tools uh, suitability was listed as borderline suitable. Our conductivity measurement from the field that we took uh, listed it as unsuitable. And then the actual calcium confirmed that it was unsuitable by the standards set by the smart prevention tool. And Mud Hen Lake went the other way where it started out as borderline suitable. Our connectivity measurement listed it as suitable, and then the lab confirmed it as indeed suitable. So it doesn't really, it's not uh, specific one way or the other. I think it's just based on the, the data being a little outdated and uh, new data will, will certainly uh, help fix that. Next slide. So we'll talk about both Burnett County's lakes and Washburn County's lakes and both uh, kind of subset of, of each county responded in the same way. Um, the, there are some outliers here, but the general trend is that the calcium measurement that was predicted using connectivity was generally a little bit lower than the actual calcium measurement in the lake that the lab derived. Uh, the outliers here are the drainage lakes that have an inflow and an outflow. They have a lot more stuff, so to speak, coming in and out. And uh, the conductivity measurement is going to be a little bit higher in those, which might skew the results uh, as compared to a seepage lake. And I want to point out that the predicted calcium in milligrams per liter here was based off of our field conductivity measurements. Um, we didn't really have uh, the need to use the old conductivity measurements because we wanted to see how accurate the equation was using current data compared to the uh, cal calcium we would get from the lab. So that's what we were comparing here, current data compared to the actual uh, lab-derived milligrams per liter. And uh, yep, Washburn County, you can essentially see the same thing here. Once again, that the predicted calcium using current measurements is just slightly lower than the actual calcium uh, that the lab would derived. And it may not seem like much, but for the lakes that ride the fine line between unsuitable and borderline or borderline and suitable, this could be pretty important. You know, it, it could really mean the difference between your, you could get zebra mussels or not. Um, and, you know, a lake, you can look here, uh, Bass Lake, for example, it's using the connectivity measurements that we got is it's listed as unsuitable. And then the lab comes back with the actual measurement and it's bumped into the borderline category. So it is a good idea if you're really interested in this to kind of see, you know, where you would fall on the spectrum. And uh, yeah, Lisa, do you have anything else you want to add for Washburn County? Yeah, I just, uh, I think it's kind of interesting that going back to the the main player here, a big Mackenzie Lake, having the zebra mussels first. Um, big Mackenzie and Lower Mackenzie pretty much have the same exact uh, calcium uh, concentration measurement. So, but there's no zebra mussels found in Lower yet. So that's just kind of an important uh, thing to remember. And I'll, I'm gonna get into that in a minute about you know, prevention and monitoring, so. Yep, and then going off of the Mackenzie Lakes is Big Mackenzie is the only one on the Mackenzie chain listed as suitable and Middle Mackenzie and Lower Mackenzie are listed as borderline. And all three of them essentially have the exact same calcium measurements. So really, truly, they all are suitable. Um, just another little uh, thing we found that certainly helps us in our, in our efforts here. Next slide. Yeah, so kind of what we were just saying, uh, no matter what your suitability is, uh, you should really still be taking those extra AIS prevention steps out there. 
Uh, we got the decontamination stations here in Washburn and Burnett. And I do know they're starting to show up in some other counties now, uh, Barron County and Bayfield County. And so that's just kind of a mix of a mild bleach solution that gets sprayed on boats going in and out of a lake. Uh, and then there's also some tools provided, a little hook for grabbing the weeds off and a soft brush to scrape any potential mud or other debris um, along the boat or trailer. And if you're in one of our two counties, um, you can give us a call and we can provide you with uh, a station. And then and of course there's you know clean boats, clean waters, which a lot of you on this call probably have going on at your landing. And if you are an inspector, thank you for your efforts out there. And of course, there's also just additional monitoring, uh, citizen lake monitoring, AIS monitoring. Uh, Paul Skowinski is the coordinator for that statewide. So if you have uh, interest in that, you can contact him or your county coordinator or the Wisconsin DNR um, citizen lake monitoring coordinator as well. Next step or next slide. Yeah, and just some final thoughts. Um, if your lake association is interested in looking at uh, what the calcium measurements are, you can easily do this. Uh, contact your local um, lake biologist with the DNR. Most citizen lake monitors or coordinators should have some equipment to help you out with this. Otherwise, like Tom said, is this is pretty uh, simple equipment. Uh, you can make it yourself. And using that uh, state lab of hygiene is definitely recommended to get a good accurate um, test on the, the calcium. And as we keep reiterating, uh, borderline is an important um, tool that we can use moving forward with our monitoring efforts as well. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, the findings from this are definitely going to prioritize where we're going to be conducting our monitoring. So as Lisa had mentioned, we have quite the zebra mussel team, so to speak, of uh, state, county, federal, tribal. Everyone's doing a lot of monitoring here. And this helps us decide which lakes we need to prioritize. We'll, we'll certainly focus on the ones that are in the, the suitable and borderline suitable category and some of the ones that uh, jump to a higher category where they may not have been before. So the data is being used and uh, yeah, it certainly helped us out. And just off that, if you're wondering what is um, kind of being done out there for prevention or what can, what can you do um, besides what I just talked about with the decon and clean boats, clean waters, uh, we have a lot of lakeshore uh, folks that have zebra mussel plates out on their docks. And so they're, they're basically going out there like once a month and checking those, seeing if any uh, villagers uh, basically grow on those, those little plates. They're just like sandwich plates put together and pretty easy to find or make or just have. You can even check your dock for, for the zebra mussels. Uh, we're also doing villager toes. So each year we go out and drop a net down and we're trying to catch villagers. So the microscopic uh, zebra mussels that you essentially can't see. We're trying to see if those are um, in the lakes. And then just general early detection monitoring. Like I said, reaching out to your coordinators and trying to get some help with monitoring is, is really important. So with that, I don't know if we have any questions, Diane. Well, Lisa, I haven't seen any questions yet. I'm gonna just remind people if they wanted to enter a question or, or even a comment, you can use the chat box and we'll bring up your issue or question. Um, we have quite a bit of time left. So if anyone had a story to share, I was curious myself about if you had um, described the life cycle so that people understand the importance of villagers versus the actual showing up of zebra mussels on, you know, on your shore, cutting your dog's toes or your child's feet. So I wondered if maybe you could share a little insight as to how the life cycle works for people who might not be familiar. Yeah, so 
What were you gonna say? Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I was gonna say Paul might actually be a, more of an expert on this than than Lisa mm -hmm. and I might be. Uh, but essentially, what happens is midsummer. That's when most of the reproduction occurs from zebra mussels, and they produce velators. Uh, it's a larval stage of zebra mussel, and they essentially kind of float around in the water column and get moved around with wave and wind action until they're essentially big enough and they settle out of the water and find a hard substrate to attach to. And then from there, they, they grow into mature adults. It takes several years uh, to get to a full size. I think, um, I think they live about four years, uh, one to four years is their, is their kind of life cycle. Um, yeah, if Paul has anything more to add on that, he certainly can. I have nothing to add. You did fabulous there, Tom. We do have a question now from Mary Jo. Does the SMART prevention tool cover all lakes in Wisconsin or only in Washburn and Burnett counties? I think you may have touched on that early, but perhaps you could reiterate. Yeah, it covers uh, the entire state of Wisconsin, and I believe it actually goes into Michigan as well. And now a question from um, Deborah. Is there a cost to having DNR provide contamination stations, the ones with the signage at bolt landings? Um, that might be a everyone question. Yeah. Or anyone have... question. <laughs> yep, no, that's a good question. Um, so we, we were provided uh, a budget to basically buy these decontamination stations with our rapid response grant. So we worked with a designer in Minnesota for the sign. And then uh, we basically, I guess Tom bought the most, most of the stuff online or wherever you could find it the cheapest and then uh, went that route. Yeah, and if you are in Burnett or Washburn counties and you have a, a landing that you would like to have a decontamination station at, we provide those at no cost to you, uh, but the maintenance and um, kind of upkeep of the solution is all on the association that's there. The other thing that I would like to mention is uh, currently the DNR does not allow these stations on their properties. Um, so all the stations that we have are on state or not are on uh, county and town owned landings. The state does not have any currently. So um, not seeing any other questions at this point, um, I was just curious if you have a perspective on how serious the issue is. And um, for example, I live up in Iron County, so I know that there are lakes in um, Michigan and certainly near Duluth that have problems with zebra mussels. Do you feel um, pressure because of more of the people pressure or is it more of the chemistry or a little of both? I think um, maybe for us, it's more of the people pressure because we've, we're so close to, uh, you know, the cities, um, Twin Cities, and then people coming up, well, from Chicago, not just for us, but just in general, not Chicago, but it's very South coming up for the summers. Um, so just people in general, I think. Um, but not knowing the rest of the chemistry and the calcium in a lot of these other lakes, that's kind of the question of, you know, if they were to get in there, you know, what's going to happen? So keeping the prevention efforts with our volunteers is key, and we really appreciate it. We have a new question. Have you determined which lakes you will be going uh, doing the villager toes on this season? I'm I still working on that part, but I think Tom has his figured out. Yeah, uh, Burnett County does have our lakes figured out for the season, and I can I have them up here. I can list them off. We'll be doing Benoit Lake this year, Green Lake, Little Wood Lake, Loon Cadot Lakes, Rooney Lake, Spirit Lake, and Mallard Lake. The St. Croix River Association, which is now called uh, Wild Rivers Conservancy, I think, um, 
and the National Park Service are doing a different subset, subset of lakes. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing a little bit different as well, but I don't have uh, theirs off the top of my head that I can name for you. Okay, well, thank you, um, Tom. Any other questions, folks? I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of new questions. We have at least another 15 minutes if people want to share concerns or questions, feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, I guess one thing I was going to mention is that it might be worth noting that Lake Superior does have these species. And so people who are boating back and forth between Lake Superior and inland waters would need to be extra careful to make sure they're not a vector for um, this and all, all other aquatic invasive species as well. Um, I don't so, know how long, do you guys have any comments you wanna share? I have one more thing I can share if I, I can share my screen here, Paul. Yep, go ahead. So this document here, we've sent this out to all of our partners in the past, um, but if anyone else is curious about this, this is a summary document that we produce every year and it shows all of the monitoring we do in Burnett and Washburn counties. So it shows where all of our decontamination stations are, where all of our plate samplers are, where we've done eDNA testing and our zebra mussel velator toes. So if anyone is curious if they're in the area, if their lake has ever been monitored, this would be where you can find it. And if you would like me to send that to you, you can email me. Awesome. Looks like a lot of work. You guys are doing a great job. Lisa, any final comments from your end? Um, just real quick, going back to the decontamination. I don't want to hound on this, but I think it's important. Uh, Barron County and Bayfield County um, also have an ordinance now as well. And there have been some videos, some decontamination educational video scenarios that we put together last fall. So Hunter Dennison, uh, who is my intern or LTE, you know, I guess he's graduated. Um, but he helped with some videos last year and we have those on a YouTube um, account. So if you're interested in seeing how the decontamination uh, works or kind of how to talk with your boaters on, you know, not being scared of it and putting it on your boat, just send uh, myself or Tom an email and be happy to share those videos with you. Well, I don't see any other questions. I just put out a little note in case someone has a last minute thought. Otherwise, um, we wanna sh share a thank you to both Lisa and Tom for your hard work and, and give, taking time today to share your work with us. Um, so thank you so much. It was awesome to learn more about uh, what you're doing in Washburn and uh, Burnett counties. Hopefully other counties are gonna follow suit and we won't be in the boat you're in with uh, Active Lakes. So oh, folks can use the reaction buttons if you wanted to thank our presenters. We do have a few minutes yet to spare. So if anything last, come, last chance comes in, we can still accommodate your question. But um, we also wanted to thank our sponsors and you can um, understand how important their role is to having this conference and putting this all together. There's going to be a little follow-up survey that'll be emailed to participants and we really appreciate your feedback. I know that what we receive in those evaluations are going to be the basis for next year and future years programming. So if you have a hot issue and you want a presentation on it, um, that's your chance to get your dibs in and tell us what you want to hear about. Um, our next talk, does welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to our session, Empowering Citizen Lake Stewardship in the Northern Highlands Ecological Landscape. I'm Diane Dalton. I'm gonna be your moderator for this session. And before we get started, I just wanna give you a few housekeeping details. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat button. You can use that chat button to um, enter your questions or comments. And at the end of the talk, I will um, share those with our presenters and we can uh, use the remaining time. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. 
Um, also, I want to remind you that this session is being recorded. So don't forget to type your questions into the chat box. We'll also possibly be entering supplemental information there if people are interested in links or some other information as we go along. Um, we're gonna ask everyone to wait until the end of the session. So we'll deal with the questions at the end of the talk and we'll try to accommodate as many as, you, as we can. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Meyer owner and manager of Nova Ecological Services, and um, also Jim Kreitlow, his colleague, also with Nova Ecological Services. Mike and Jim work together to provide consultation for lake associations and property owners in Vilas, Oneida, Iron, and Forest Counties. Before founding Nova Ecological Services, Mike worked as research scientist for the Wisconsin DNR for 25 years. His work over those years has focused on wildlife toxicology, shoreland habitat restoration, and climate change impacts in northern Wisconsin. Mike is a board member of Wisconsin Green Fire and a longstanding member of the Wildlife Society. Jim Kreitlow worked as water resource biologist for the Bureau of Watershed Management with the Wisconsin DNR for 31 years, Ooh, specializing in watershed planning and lake and river management. His expertise in psychology, not to be confused with psychology, although there might have been a little of that as well, has made him the northern go-to guy for water clarity problems caused by algae. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and Jim. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, we're going to kind of do a tag team here. I'm going to um, present two projects to you folks. And these projects have been designed to empower lake associations and property owners to take on the task of lake protection in the uh, era of a reduction in um, shoreland regulation at the local and state level. We think it's important for lake associations and property owners to have the tools they need to ensure that their lake water quality and property values are protected going forward. And so uh, I'm going to describe two projects. The first one we completed for the Tomahawk Lake Association. And it was a uh, combination of mapping uh, critical habitat on Tomahawk Lake, as well as assessing the condition of individual property shorelands. And the second talk, uh, Jim is going to present for you folks. And it's a project that we're just getting started, it's a uh, uh, what we call a toolbox for lake property owners and lake associations such that they can access data uh, relevant to their lakes, uh, their specific lakes from the DNR primarily. There's a huge uh, amount of data available, but we're put, putting together a toolbox that allows individuals and lake associations to walk their way through this data and pull out the important data necessary to uh, make the best management decisions for their lakes. So uh, what I'll do right now is run through this first project that we completed for the Tomahawk Lake Association. And then I'll give, a, uh, give it over to Jim, but I'll provide a little segue between the two talks so that uh, you can understand how they differ. So with that, uh, this project that I'm gonna talk about first, we initiated in 2019, at the behest of the Tomahawk Lake Association, they requested that we uh, assist them in engaging their property owners in uh, education and outreach related to uh, best management practices for um, protecting the shoreland areas. And it was supported by a grant from uh, the DNR through the Lake uh, Planning Grant Program. And the project goal is, was simply uh, to encourage private and public landowners to implement shoreland best management practices, particularly in ecologically sensitive shoreland regions of Tomahawk Lake when needed. Our assumption is that by increasing knowledge of the ecologically important features of Tomahawk Lake, landowners near these sites will be encouraged to adopt shoreland best management practices. And I'll flesh that out a little bit more. So uh, to do that, uh, we started by creating a GIS map of the critical fish and wildlife habitat on Tomahawk Lake. Uh, after that, we, 
or in conjunction with that, we created a GIS map of the shoreline conditions at individual uh, tax parcels adjacent to Tomahawk Lake. And then we use these GIS maps to identify properties with surface water runoff, erosion, or habitat loss that we assess during our surveys to target our education and outreach efforts to promote uh, best management practices. And we uh, prioritize these outreach efforts by identifying those properties in need of improvement that are in close proximity to critical habitat features. So the first uh, thing we did was to identify the critical habitat on Tomahawk Lake. And I'll describe critical habitat in a little more detail. This includes fish spawning and nursery areas, critical habitat for shoreland wildlife species, important wetlands, and features that promote water quality, as well as shorelands that lend natural scenic beauty to the lake. And as I mentioned, the deliverable is a GIS map of these critical habitats. Uh, we found 39 critical habitat features on Tomahawk Lake, and I'll quickly run through how we presented that to the uh, Lake Association. But first, this is the uh, uh, critical habitat designation manual that is still in draft form, but it's the protocol that we use to identify the critical habitat on Tomahawk Lake. Uh, as I mentioned, these were the features that we were looking for on Tomahawk Lake as we did our shoreland surveys. Fish, fish and, and fish habitat for spawning, nursery, feeding, and cover, including coarse wood, rock, gravel, rubble substrate, and aquatic plant diversity. As far as wildlife and wildlife habitat, we were looking primarily at the shoreland buffer and the uh, wetland habitat uh, areas, as well as coarse woody cover, which is an important uh, attribute for both fish and wildlife. And then we also asked, does certain sites of the shoreline uh, serve as a nutrient or physical buffer zone? Does it stabilize the sediment, thus promoting water quality? And then we uh, mapped all the important wild wetland features and noted if these sites uh, lend themselves towards natural scenic beauty. And uh, this is just the north end of the lake. Altogether, we identified 39 critical habitat areas and this is the south end. Uh, Tomahawk Lake is a large lake. It's over 3,000 acres. It has a lot of public land. And so we found quite a few important natural features on this lake that we wanted to educate the property owners about, uh, as well as uh, relate their shoreline conditions to these sites. But for each of these uh, individual 39 critical habitat sites, we put together a physical description of the site, a map, and then we uh, explain why this site we designated as critical habitat. And here you see a listing of all six attributes we found at this one uh, Kemp uh, wetland area. And at, finally, we would, at uh, the end of the report, provide management recommendations to protect that critical habitat. We also uh, use GPS to uh, create waypoints for all coarse wood on the uh, Tomahawk Lake. Like I said, it's important for fish and wildlife habitat. And critical uh, coarse wood is defined as, by the DNR, uh, five feet in length, four inches in diameter, and uh, in, in the water, submerged or uh, um, against the shoreline or crossing the shoreline. So each of those little blue dots represents a a uh, piece of that coarse wood and where it's most dense, you have the best uh, coarse wood habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, in, in addition to the coarse wood, we also identified areas where rock and rubble substrate was uh, common. And these are important spawning areas for uh, walleye and white sucker. So uh, these are, and smallmouth. These are areas we considered uh, important enough to include in our critical habitat designation. Uh, we were fortunate that a, a, a aquatic plant community survey, a point intercept survey was conducted on Tomahawk Lake. So we were able to identify what parts of the lake were important from the aquatic macrophyte plant community standpoint. So all these uh, and the wetland features uh, helped us define the critical habitat areas of Tomahawk Lake. Then we went on to identify uh, the human impacts on Tomahawk Lake. And the first thing we did was to go 
to note during our surveys, uh, individual properties where they're mostly commercial, where we would uh, often see more than 15 people concentrated at the property, obvious signs of recreation, large amounts of boats, and uh, created a, a G, uh, GIS map of these sites. And altogether, this is the north and south end of a Tomahawk Lake. We have about a half dozen commercial properties that fit that category, as well as several Northern Highlands American Legion State Forest sites where people would picnic and pontoon boat in large rafts of uh, individuals numbering 30 to 50 at a time. And unfortunately, or it just is what it is, these sites coincide with a lot of the critical habitat areas for fish spawning. So uh, we felt it important to point out even on state properties where human impacts are likely occurring. And for each of these sites, we did a little narrative about what we observed and what made some small recommendations on how they could mitigate their impacts. And uh, finally, we did a survey where we assessed the shoreline condition at individual properties on Tomahawk Lake. There was 414 individual properties, so it was quite a chore. We uh, completed it in July and August. And we followed the DNR Lake Shoreland and Shallows Habitat Mapping Field Protocol. Uh, it, it's a how to uh, conduct a whole lake survey uh, doing these individual property shoreland assessments. And basically, as you're doing the survey for each property, you're uh, providing a riparian buffer description, you're looking for ongoing erosion and runoff concerns, you're evaluating the condition of the bank. You're looking for human modifications in the littoral and shoreland area, and you make note of the aquatic plant presence or absence. And this is just a little uh, snapshot of the north end of the lake. As you can see, lots of small lots. So we uh, did an individual shoreland assessment on each one. And uh, larger, larger um, blocks in the southern end where the state uh, forest properties were more common. But this is just a snapshot of one of the data sheets. Each column represents a individual tax parcel. And in the column, you can see we described the uh, condition of the riparian buffer, the number of human structures in the riparian zone, any runoff concerns in the uh, uh, shoreland area or the bank zone, and the condition of the littoral zone, and made note of the aquatic plant community. And these are just some maps that show uh, where some of the properties, not to be named, but where some of the properties were that in this case, we observed gulling and channeling on the shoreland. And what is interesting to note is those that are in close proximity to critical habitat areas. Uh, as you can see, PL37 contains a property that is, uh, uh, has some ongoing uh, runoff concerns. And this is important to note because uh, a lot of these rock and rubble sites can be covered with sedimentation. So uh, if you wanna maintain a good uh, fish spawning area for walleye and white sucker, you want to uh, do your best to maintain uh, uh, minimal sediment runoff. Now these are shorelands where we look, uh, where we found the bank erosion problem to be present. Those are those in green, light green or th those were dark green. And in this case, uh, the light green parcels are those where the shoreland buffer was at least 50% replaced with manicured lawn and impervious surface such as concrete or asphalt. So once again, we were looking for those sites that were in close proximity to critical habitat. And so we overlaid the two, the shoreland assessment and the critical habitat and we drilled down to the individual critical habitat sites and identified which properties in close proximity are uh, impaired from the standpoint of buffer condition or sedimentation and surface runoff. And these were the ones that we recommended to the Lake Association, their education and outreach program targets. Uh, this is another uh, view at the south end of the lake. Uh, notice LT63 on the uh, uh, mid right side there, that's a state parcel. That's one of these sites where uh, there's a lot of uh, pontoon boats and picnicking going on. So there's a channeling and gullying and a lot of sediment runoff. And unfortunately, it's right across a 
great fish spawning area where there's a lot of coarse wood and rock and rubble. So um, making, making it a point to let the uh, you know, state managers know as well as the property owners where these conditions exist. Now, because these are all linked to the uh, uh, county zoning and uh, tax assessment offices, you can identify the individual property owners with these impairments for your education and outreach uh, efforts. And we provided a, a list of recommendations to the Lake Association for use of the report. And at this present time, um, they are sharing our project with the Lake Association members and they're rolling out their education and outreach program to the individual properties. So that's one illustration of how we're trying to um, gear up an individual lake association with information about their lakes to take to the property owners with the overall goal of enlisting them in uh, activities that'll safeguard lake water quality and uh, their property values. Now, th this is more of an active type of a project. Uh, we were on the ground, we were assessing shorelands. Uh, the next project I'm going to introduce you to is one that I'm working with. Well, there's another slide like this at the end if you have questions that you'd like to uh, address to us outside of this workshop. Uh, but this next project that Jim's gonna talk to you about is what we're calling our uh, uh, Northern Highlands Lake User Toolbox Project. And Wisconsin Green Fire came to us, they had a grant and they wanted to uh, find a way to um, arm lake associations with all the data that they need to make the proper um, management decisions about which way to go with lake planning for their lakes. If they're completely new to the lake planning program and they're coming to the table, where do they start? So what, we came, what we're coming up with is a means for the individual lake associations to uh, learn as much about what is known about their lake. And that'll, we hope, guide them towards uh, making decisions about what types of planning and management approaches they need to take. So with that as a uh, opening, I'm going to turn this over to Jim and he'll walk you through this project, which as I mentioned at the onset is still, we're still developing it. We're working with the DNR to develop this as well as the Lake Association members. And uh, I'll let Jim take it from there. Well, hello everybody. Hope everybody's doing fine out there. Uh, a little background is that I've worked in lakes for a number of years. So Mike came to me with some ideas of once he uh, got this grant for the Northern Highland uh, Lake Toolbox. So um, a lot of this stuff on here are some of my thoughts. Again, it's a work in progress, but uh, we're hoping to get comments as we go along and, and try to make this process better. Then as Mike described, um, it was the Oneida County Lakes and Rivers Association uh, associations that actually uh, came to Green Fire and, and um, Mike to say that, hey, there's a lot of information out there. We don't really know where to find it. And we would like to have somebody train us. And so this project is gonna be a, uh, a first cut screening uh, tools to provide the lake associations and information to allow them to interpret uh, the data. But ultimately um, we would like them to to be able to use this information as future uh, planning on their lake and try to make some uh, management decisions on their own. Essentially, they won't maybe not have to hire a consultant. They might be able to find this information uh, themselves. So our objectives, what we would like these lake uh, groups to learn is, you know, essentially the basic ecology of the lake, you know, just to learn uh, some limnology. Uh, second objective is to maybe look at the uh, watershed and are there any current risks that might impact uh, lake water quality. And then at the shoreland level, you know, uh, shoreland development and what impacts that has on lake quality, critical fish and wildlife habitat, uh, so forth. And then ultimately uh, try to prioritize you know, what management activities they can do to improve um, the water quality in the lake. 
So uh, the toolbox, you know, is gonna actually lay out a process so a, a lake group or a lake individual can actually find this information. We're gonna lay out a program for them to access these databases uh, that Department of Natural Resources has. Uh, the goal is to try to allow these folks to navigate, you know, directly to this information. Uh, when I was working for DNR, there was an overabundance of information out there. We're gonna try to um, uh, directly, you know, get these groups to be able to find this you know, information easily. So what we're initially gonna do is uh, we're gonna have um, three workshops and we're gonna have one or two learning modules in each workshop with a total of five uh, that will be shared. Initially, we're gonna roll this out with uh, four to five uh, volunteers or board members from Volunteer Lake Association. And we're gonna run through this process and get their feedback. Uh, subsequently, we wanna add maybe five to 10 lake associations um, and run through this again to, as we work out the bugs. But ultimately, we're gonna uh, put this online uh, with training modules all recorded so that uh, different lake groups can access on demand. So now I'm getting into the, the meat and nuts and bolts of this is how, how we propose to do this. And workshop one is gonna have uh, two modules. Uh, the first one is gonna be introduction to the lake user toolbox and the basics of lake ecology, which is module two. As Mike mentioned in the introduction, we're, we're trying to encourage lake associations to, to do this work from the bottom up to, to try to improve lake water quality rather than having a government come from uh, top down. So overall, it's, we're trying to get them to do the right thing. Oneida County Lakes and Rivers uh, Association put out a document uh, saying uh, it's described doing the right thing. And we're gonna try to weave the toolbox into this document um, to try to highlight reasons why folks should be uh, concerned with their lakes in Northern Wisconsin. This is uh, the Oneida County Lakes and Rivers document and doing the right thing. And we're gonna try to tie, tie the uh, toolbox to a lot of these issues that are listed you know, to try to improve the quality of their lakes, um, stewardship of the shorelines, uh, economy of the North, indicating that, hey, if you protect shoreline and lake water quality, uh, you're likely to preserve your property values. And then the last one is for lake community and government. Uh, you know, zoning is, is kind of disappeared. So try to uh, provide folks the incentive to do the right thing uh, on their lakes. So module number two uh, is essentially a basics of lake ecology. Um, we're gonna put a presentation together that's gonna have some of the ele elements on the right-hand side, uh, describing lake types, physical characteristics of lakes, uh, chemical, biological, um, riparian habitat characteristics, uh, signs of environmental degradation. But the point here is, we want to try to provide the information to these lake user groups about lake ecology so they can understand and interpret the data they're collecting. So the workshop two is going to have two modules. Uh, the first module or module number three is, is what data should I be collecting uh, for their lake as they, they go through this exercise? And then module four is gonna be uh, the methods or um, a worksheet that we're gonna develop for a data acquisition. So as far as data collection, uh, what I thought would be useful for lakes to, as a uh, lake groups as a gathering data is to actually use the data sheet provided in the surface water grant program uh, application and grant guidance, which uh, lays out uh, a data gap analysis. So right now, what we propose is, is all the information that we have listed here is, is what we're gonna direct these lake user groups to find. Um, 
about their lake. They may not find it all, but uh, quite a bit of it is there. Uh, I did run through a number of different lakes and quite a bit of this information uh, is available. So module four, we're gonna actually put up a put together a data sheet and uh, it's patterned again after the data gap analysis, but this is the information that we're gonna be looking at and that folks are gonna be collecting uh, and actually filling in a data sheet uh, as they go through the on-site websites uh, to gather the information. So actually there's actually 12 elements here and it's essentially just patterned after, after the um, data gap analysis uh, recommendation in the planning guidance. So what we've done for these folks to access this data easily is we've, we've put together a worksheet and essentially it's instructions uh, and the links are gonna be embedded but we've got about a four page document that um, a lake group can actually go in and, and access these sites and answer the questions listed to uh, obtain their data. And what Mike's done is he's just added the links as they go through on this uh, worksheet page so they know that they're, they're at the right place. Only, only put on a couple of pages here, but it, it just, gives you a feel that uh, how we're gonna do this and, and uh, how, how they're gonna get up, obtain the data. So what I'm gonna do now is just run into or, or go over some of the websites that we're gonna be using and, and it, that the lake groups are gonna be uh, accessing. Uh, the first one is the Wisconsin uh, DNR Lakes page. So they'll actually be able to uh, go in here and you know, type in their name of their lake, the county they're allowed, um, located in, and actually do a data search. And when they enter, you know, Tomahawk Lake will come up and over the top, you'll see overview, map, facts and figures, and more. Uh, this is kind of a starting point where they can start to obtain their data. Um, and there's various information about the fishery and different things here that allows them to fill out uh, the data sheet. Facts and figures, you know, it pulls up some basic information on their lake and type of lake that it, it is and some statistics about it. Again, allowing them to gain access um, to this information. Also, I note that there's information on invasive species uh, located within their lake, which is also part of some of the questions we'll be at asking uh, them as they obtain their data. On the more page, lists all kinds of uh, other information they can get access to, um, whether there's been any fish survey reports, uh, but probably the most important aspect on this page is uh, the water quality reports and data. Uh, if they click that link, It'll take it right, right to the Citizen Lakes uh, monitoring page and it'll list all the information that's been collected on, under this example is Tomahawk Lake. Um, so they can get a lot of the information on water chemistry, trophic state index, et cetera. Another viewer that we'll be using is a surface water data viewer. And What's valuable about this site is that, again, you can um, use the interactive link and click on it and, and you know, bring up the lake that you're uh, wanting to access information on. Uh, this is Tomahawk Lake. And once you're in the surface water data viewer, you just click on Tomahawk Lake and it'll start pulling up uh, additional information about it. Um, and again, if you look, you'll see overview, conditions, goals, a lot of different tabs where they can pull up information uh, to get the information that they need. Under ecosystem challenges, um, what that allows 
folks is to gain information about where Tomahawk Lake is located and what watershed and what some of the primary uh, land uses are. Gives them a feel to whether or not they may have some water quality problems uh, in their watershed or not. Under the conditions tab, again, it'll pull up any other data that's associated with Lake Tomahawk uh, as far as any other plans, et cetera. Um, and this is available for, for all lakes that have had work done on them. Another feature of the um, website page is that you're able to uh, create maps. And this map shows uh, all the wetlands um, around the lake and then uh, you might want to uh, consider lake associations sort of reviewing that uh, for critical habitat areas they might want to protect in the future. The uh, surface water data viewer also allows you to uh, gain access to uh, public lands. So you can uh, find whether or not there's any state or federal lands that uh, might uh, determine if you have any protected shorelands that might be natural, again, um, would, would point you towards the critical habitat and or critical shorelands that you might want to protect. And another feature that you can get to is, it, is the assessments and impairments, where um, part of the information that the lake groups will be collecting is whether or not their lake is impaired or not. But under the, in this website, you can actually um, zoom out uh, and find out whether or not there are any impaired waters in the area or if your lake is impaired. And what I mean by impaired is whether or not uh, the, the lake is, has, has any water quality standard uh, violations, um, such as total phosphorus concentration, dissolved oxygen, or fish health advisory. Another link uh, is the lake's uh, AIS data viewer. And in that um, site, lake associations can find out whether or not any shoreland evaluation work has been done. Uh, we did this on Lake Tomahawk and it's, there's, there's not a lot of lakes that have had this work done, but there, there are a few. So uh, some folks can, uh, can access this data if, if your lake has had a, a shoreland evaluation uh, conducted. And this last one shows the uh, satellite derived water clarity. If there is no information or water chemistry on a lake, oftentimes you can find uh, clarity and in information uh, from this website to describe some indication of what the water quality is. So after the lake groups have obtained all this information, uh, we're gonna have a workshop three and it's gonna be using this data to chart a course. Now this part of the um, project that we're working on is probably the least developed. We still need to work with DNR a little bit more on um, what the potential outcomes would be and, and how, what direction we wanna point these lake groups after they've collected their information. But potential outcomes would be, um, again, they, could, they might find out that they need to collect more information. They might want to uh, uh, enter the Citizens Lake Monitoring Program. They might want to have a PI survey conducted on their lake uh, or shoreland evaluation. You know, there might be some lakes out there that, that do have some watershed problems um, or invasive species, something that where they might, might require a, a comprehensive management plan if there's um, any management that they need to do as far as chemical treatments, et cetera. And the third one is focus management planning. And I think a majority of the lakes up in the headwaters area will probably fit this um, where they don't have a large uh, problem in the watershed because most of them are gonna be headwater lakes, but yet there might be some issues on the lake as far as plant management or uh, shoreland development uh, that they might wanna take a look at. So that might be a lake, a lake protection uh, focus. And there may be um, lakes out there that may not need a plan. Um, they might be eligible to just get into the Healthy Lakes program. 
But as I mentioned earlier, this is where we need to do a little bit more work. But in this module, what we're gonna be doing is, is again, focusing on the surface water grant program. And in the appendix B, they have a, um, a management planning uh, plan that we're gonna uh, look at to try to follow. And I won't get into a lot of detail here, but if you look across the top, this is kind of what we're gonna be looking at. We're gonna try to get these lake groups to do the, the first two, you know, the planning needs assessment and data um, gap analysis, you know, to try to determine whether or not they need a comprehensive management plan or not. And this is kind of busy, but uh, this last slide just kind of lays out a framework that uh, we're gonna look into a little bit more to try to um, direct these lake groups once, you know, they've compiled the information. But again, you know, it's a work in progress and it's, it's something that we're trying to put together that a, a, a lake association that, that's new to this or even just an individual where they can have a process where they can go out and obtain their information um, essentially with a process that we're going to lay out for them uh, that allows them to gain access to the DNR websites in an orderly fashion and find this information without having to search all over. So um, that's pretty much it. So I guess we can take any questions if anybody has any. So again, thanks guys. Um, if anyone does have questions, just a reminder to throw this into the little chat box. It should be at the lower portion of your screen. I haven't seen any yet. We've got a few people maybe wondering this or that. So this is your chance to hop on it. I was curious if maybe Mike, you wanted to just tell people what Wisconsin's Green Fire is in case people are unfamiliar. Sure. Um, Wisconsin Green Fire formed in 2017. As you mentioned, I'm on the board of directors. And it, it's basically a, a nonprofit organization that promotes uh, um, natural policy, natural resource policy uh, from the standpoint of uh, science basis. Um, a lot of natural resource management in Wisconsin has been politicized. Uh, a lot of our institutions uh, suffer from some political influence. And uh, Green Fire's goal is to kind of still follow the science without uh, um, pretty much taking a side one, one way or the other on the issues other than following the best uh, um, professional guidance or what the science says when uh, developing natural resource policy. We're active right now in uh, uh, making recommendations on uh, clean energy for Wisconsin, uh, the uh, wolf hunt for 2021 uh, for the fall. We've weighed into that with our recommendations. Uh, a lot of issues that uh, the citizens of the state may find uh, um, have been complicated by politics. We're trying to provide just drill down to the science. What does the science say? What do the professional managers say about these issues? And we put out white papers and uh, make uh, testimony at legislative hearings. Uh, there's over 400 of us now, many, many or most are uh, retired natural resource professionals. So uh, amongst our ranks are some of the uh, um, uh, best folks in all of these natural resource areas, uh, many with over 30 years of experience. So uh, right now, as I mentioned, we started in 2017. We're into our going into our fifth year. Membership's over 400, and uh, we're based out of Madison and uh, Northern Wisconsin. So uh, if you have an interest in learning more, there's a website and a Facebook site. It's Wisconsin's Green Fire, and we're always looking for new members. And the uh, website has a lot of uh, drop-down menus where you can learn about what we do, uh, who the members are, how you can join, what you can uh, actually become engaged in through working groups. If you have a professional interest in some aspects of natural resources, we have nine working groups. Uh, 
ranging from wildlife management, fisheries management to uh, lakes and climate change. Uh, you can look at our menu of working groups and uh, sign up to be a participant. So uh, that is the uh, overview of the uh, Green Fire Group. And I encourage you to just Google Wisconsin's Green Fire and learn a lot more because it's, it's a very active group. We're, we're, we're making a difference and we're growing. So uh, I, I'm kind of pitching it, but uh, it's definitely taking worth taking a look at. Thanks, Mike. I don't have any questions yet. We have about 10 minutes or so remaining. If people, this might be a good chance for you to pick some expert with 30 years or so of experiences brains, uh, Dr. Mikey and Mr. Jim. Um, Questions, anybody? I don't see any, but maybe it's just that time of the day when everybody's fried and it's beautiful out. Could be. Um, I'll just give this a couple more minutes and see if anyone has any last minute comments or questions. But I do wanna thank Mike and Jim for taking the time to give us this wonderful breath of experience and kind of breath of fresh air, how, to, how we're kind of strategizing to help landowners get together and do some of the work instead of having to hire a consultant. And sometimes I think that can be a bit overwhelming for people. So this will be a great thing to follow and see how the toolbox works. I'm excited. Um, if anyone wants to uh, use the reaction buttons, that's how we're uh, these days when we can't see each other in person or hopefully that will change next year. But uh, there's a reaction button that you can do the thumbs up or you can just give it a like wahoo or <laughs> lots of different emoticons. Um, but we definitely wanna thank you guys for helping out and showing us all your, your dreams here and how this is gonna help make a difference. I also want to help um, thank all of our sponsors who support the conference. Obviously, we couldn't do it without you, and uh, you know who you are. Um, we do have a page that we'll list at the end of the talk here, all of our sponsors. So thank you so much to all of the sponsors with whom we couldn't make this possible.